Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. This is Daryl. Uh, just to confirm, I want someone to uh, type in chat that you are hearing my voice and you're seeing the screen and everything's five by five. Uh, I'm expecting everything to be trouble free today. Yes. All right. So we continue. So this is week three. This is the week we actually start creating the presentation. So we've tried to strip this week down and make it as few other activities as possible. So you can concentrate on that one large activity. Uh, those of you that turned in your, um, your uh, uh, plans last night, I uh, have been able to go through them and get them back to you. Most of them are really good and you're on the right track. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to great things from you guys. I think most of you get it and you know what I'm looking for. But this is the week that I want you to start with a blank canvas, go through the full process and create a presentation. And uh, the first part of that is going to be taking the notes that you put together about the things that you might say and creating a cohesive story out of that. You're going to create a voiceover script. The very first thing I want you to work on is what you're going to say. So you do not necessarily have to write a script. You don't have to turn that in for a grade or anything, but it is a great first step to put it to paper, both to control for timing. I want you to create something that's three to four minutes long. If you're a little bit short, it's okay. If you're a little bit long, it's okay. But we're targeting for that amount of time. And uh, you can control that by how much you write. And once you've written what you wanna say down, I want you to practice it before you record it. I want you to say it out loud. It's very different writing something and hearing it in your head than saying it out loud and hearing it with your own voice. And sometimes you'll wanna change your phrase or two. Sometimes you'll come into a sentence that's just hard to say. So either you rehearse it and uh, learn to say it a couple of times or maybe change the language so it feels a little more natural to you. But once you're comfortable speaking it out loud, then I want you to make a recording. Uh, this is a lot easier than re rehearsing in front of a, a live audience. But uh, you, you get to record it as many times as you like. It's very easy with the software we have, whether you're recording it with your phone or your uh, laptop, uh, you just run through it. And if, it, if it's good, you keep it. If it's not good, you can just do it over. It doesn't take anything more than reading through it in real time. Uh, one of the softwares that we recommend if you have a laptop is Audacity. It's open source software and it's editing software for regular folks. Uh, those of you that are taking audio production, I'm sure you have access to higher end tools and more sophisticated things and you know lots of techniques. We're not looking for fancy uh, audio recording here. We're looking for just a good solid true recording. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your voice nice and clear. And the best way to do that is to get a good recording up front. The best way to get a good recording is to have the mic in the right place. That means if you're using a phone, you're holding it about three or four inches away from your mouth as you're speaking. If you're using your computer, you're identifying where the microphone is on your computer and making sure that your mouth in is, is in close enough to get a strong signal. If you're using your computer and you're using an, uh, an external microphone, then you'll obviously know where that microphone is. It'll probably be a little bit higher quality microphone and it will probably give you a better signal. Uh, those of you that have gaming gear and want to use your streaming headset gear, as long as it's uh, configurable with the audio uh, recording uh, software that you use, it works fine. And uh, I think that uh, Audacity does a pretty good job of adapting to that kind of gear. So uh, the best thing to do is to get your voiceover done in the first part of the week. And once that's complete, then you'll add slides to it. Remember, the, the reason most people's PowerPoints fail is that they open the software too soon. They start in PowerPoint. And I want you to do that. I want you to start with the voiceover, create that. And once you have a good audio recording, then you can start adding slides to it. And uh, that'll be an interesting thing to do. 
Now, we do have more reading this week. We have some reading from Slideology and we have some reading from Resonate. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the reading is about creating content that breaks through and it has an impact. It focuses on the audience. It tells stories. These are things that we've showed you before. But again, Nancy's uh, not one to, to uh, shy away from repeating herself if that helps get her message through. She wants you to show, don't tell. You know, when, you, when it comes to the slides, make sure that you're picking slides that help people understand what you're saying. And she wants you to visualize ideas. Now, what I mean by this is that there's an awful lot of language that we use that ends up getting reused. You know, a whole lot of what you're going to be talking about in your presentation is stuff that might be in your resume. And as, as part of your resume, it may be language that everybody else is using. I'm a, I'm a out of the box thinker. I'm a, I'm a self starter, uh, et cetera. And uh, these are all good things to say, but by virtue of everyone else having said them, they have a little less power as words. But what you can do now is start to use images combined with those words to help get their power back. So I have a little exercise that I want us to work on right now. I'm gonna dump out of the slide, you know, and take us to a page that I created for us. Um, in, you're gonna find this page linked to, if you're listening on video, you're gonna find this page linked to in the discussion board. This week's discussion board is not for a grade. You'll see that it has zero weight. So this week's discussion board is simply for you to share tips and ideas and feedback with your colleagues. So I want you to use that as a sounding board while you're working, but it is not necessarily something external that you have to do for a grade. So to that extent, to get this started, I've seeded this with uh, a couple of movies that I think you should watch. And I have a, a number of useful links here. And one of the links that I have is a shared document that I've created called Visualizing Ideas. And what I'm gonna do right now is take that link. This is a Google document, meaning that it's a, uh, a document that shares permissions. And everyone who links and everyone who clicks on this link that I just put in the chat box is gonna to go to the very same page and you're all gonna be on the same page, but you're not gonna be on the same page as viewers. You're gonna be on the same page as owners of the document. This is a, a little bit dangerous, so we have to work together collaboratively, collaboratively, so there are rules. Any one of you could hit select all and delete and wipe out the entire page. So I'm giving you all a lot of power but in order for people to work collaboratively on the same live page, you kind of have to have a method for working. So the method I've created is that uh, the idea here is that I want you to find images that will um, uh, be your version of visualizing some kind of standard language that we often see in a lot of uh, resumes and uh, um, um, life stories. You know, the person says, I'm adventurous, or I'm dependable, I'm a team player, I'm eager, I'm a, top, I'm a problem solver. Well, how can you make that language come alive? Oh, someone there's uh, editorializing on my headline. So we can see that I've given you all a lot of power. And so I want you to use that responsibly. And the way I've done it here is that each of you is going to pick a word or in, all, all the words. This is voluntary, you don't have to do this, but I want you to participate if you can. But I want you to pick a word and then try to visualize it with your personal style and with your personal audience in mind. How are you going to impress them? You can pick anything to illustrate a term, but what is the choice that you're going to make? So each of you has the opportunity to illustrate this term. And so in the row, uh, in, uh, in the column below the word, you can post your picture that you choose. And instead of uh, everybody using the first row, because it's there's not enough room, I have plenty of rows for everyone. And so before you actually make your visual choice, I want you to select a, a, a box for yourself. 
So you're going to do that by going to the small row and put your name. So I've done the first one here. Uh, as an example of adventurous, I have a painting uh, of a guy standing on the edge of a cliff looking into the far horizon. To me, that says adventurous with my personal style in the way that I want it to, to mean to other people. So I'm going to do another one right now. I'm going to do team player. And, and to that extent, I've claimed the box. I've put my name in the small area. So that's the first thing I want each of you to do. Whenever you choose one of these words you want to do, choose a box. It doesn't have to be the first row. Give it the second row or the third row or whatever row you pick. You then put your name in it so that uh, other people won't pick it. And so when you, once you put your name in it, then you're going to put your cursor in the large box. Each of you has a different cursor and you can identify your cursor because it has the same color as you. As you came in, you were each identified as a different kind of, you know, funny little animal with a different color. And your color is also the color of your cursor. So as you're all here together, you each have different colored cursors and you can place them wherever you want. Wherever you place your cursor, you have the ability to change the page. So once you've claimed a page for your, claimed a spot for yourself by putting your name in there, then I want you to leave your cursor in the larger spot because that is where your picture is going to drop. So now we've done that, we're going to search for images. Now, this is a Google page. So Google has built search in, right into the page. It's a very uh, useful thing to do. So if I go up to the insert menu, insert image, and there's some choices here, search the web, then on my right hand side, I'm gonna have a Google search page. So this is built in. Anything that I put in here is gonna go straight into uh, my documents here. So most of you, the first thing you'll do once you get this Google search page is just type in the term. So if I type in the term I'm looking for, I'm looking for team player. If I type in team player, I know exactly what I'm gonna get right now. Google is pretty predictable. Uh, soccer being the, the number one uh, sport around the world, I'm just gonna have thousands of images of soccer players. But to me, that's not exciting. That's not really saying team player. That's not the image I was thinking of. And you can use this search box any way you like. You, you could put in the term, and if you put in the term, then just be prepared to search and search and search. You know, don't be the guy that chooses the very first images. Don't be that guy. That's lazy thinking. You know, if you're gonna search for a term and there are uh, 4 million returns, you know, don't go through all 4 million, but dang, go through 100,000. Uh, so spend a little time doing this. Uh, this, this is your uh, representation of yourself. It's worth doing right if you're gonna do it at all. But for me, I have an image in my head of the thing that I want, and I don't really need to use the term team player. And so instead of putting team player in the search engine, I'm going to put skydive formation. Because in my head, the image that's exciting to me that would, would say team player is somebody, you know, falling through the air, trying to grab everybody, grab them up with their, their, their compadres and making a formation. So I look through these and I find one I like. When I find one I like, I like this one here, I click on it. It has a blue check mark on it, and down at the bottom of the page, it asks, it tells me that I have one image selected, and I have a button here for inserting it. So if this is the image I like, I click insert, and then the search page goes away, and it puts my image right here. So that's the process. It's not very difficult. You claim a page uh, based on the word that you want to use, put your cursor in the larger box, then go up to the insert image, search the web choice. And you use that Google search box to search for the exact image that expresses who you are. So I'm gonna let you guys work on that while I keep talking. This is just an exercise that can help you try to form the right images for slides. Because it's sometimes it's not just enough to express the word, you have to express the word with the verb and style and, and uh, artistic appeal, the aesthetic 
that is you because everything you do about your presentation speaks about you and you're using this as proof of your artistic skill. So you want to do this in a way that impresses people. And again, for those of you who are watching on the videotape, I've linked this in on uh, uh, the 3.3 page where I have a number of different interesting things to look at. And you guys can participate in this throughout the week. And so uh, we can comment on this back and forth in the discussion board as well. So coming back here, that's visualize the ideas. I'm gonna let you guys work on that while I keep going. Uh, so the, the main thing that you need to get figured out in the beginning of the week is if you're gonna tell your story, what is the form of the story that you're going to tell? How are you gonna put your separate elements, your, your, you know, the bits and pieces of your life the, the, uh, the skills that you have, the classes you attended, the experiences that you've lived, how are you gonna put that together into a single story that says who you are? Now, for most of us, you probably wanna do it in chronological order. That might make sense. But not everybody lives the same life. Not everybody has the same story to tell. So there are different ways to tell a story. And so, figuring out the structure of that, figuring out the form of the story that you want to tell is an important way to go. And uh, it's important to look at what other people do, take note of it so that maybe you can use some of those ideas next time. It's important to try new and different things. But figuring out uh, the way you want to tell your story is the most important uh, decision that you begin with. And uh, you need to make that decision so you can begin. So to that extent, I've, I've uh, put a couple of movies in the discussion board to help you guys get along. Uh, both of the movies are interesting. The first movie is a uh, TED Talk by a fellow named Simon Sinek. And I think this is gonna be helpful to a lot of people. So a lot of you are thinking of, you know, how do I talk about myself in a way that's not boring? You know, what am I doing making this presentation? And you're pretty much thinking that it's your resume come to life. And that's not a bad way to think about it. Uh, but if you think your resume is boring and you think you're boring and you don't add any extra to it, guess what you end up with? Um, so you have to figure out a way to make your story come alive. And if you're looking at your resume and saying, well, this is just a bunch of stuff I did doesn't really add up to who I am. You know, how can I break out of that? Well, this video from Simon Sinek is very, very helpful. Because Simon Sinek just gives us the very simple change of perspective of, okay, you look at that resume and you look at all that stuff on your resume and you say, you worked here from such and such to such and such. And you went to this school and you got this degree and you were in the army from these years to this years, et cetera. That's what you did. That's just a listing of facts. Those are those things that don't connect. And so our brain doesn't really remember them on after, after hearing them going through our head. But if you turn that on its side, instead of saying what you did, but you use that same very, that very same list of elements from your resume and you tell us why you did each one of those, what was the intrinsic motivation that led you to join the army? What was the intrinsic motivation that led you to get X job? What was the intrinsic motivation that led you to go to this school and learn these classes? Well, that's really interesting. That's starting to tell us who you are and what your ideas are and, and, and what your hopes and fears are. Start with why. That's science and X big idea. And if you turn your resume on its side, and use that as the template for telling your story. But instead of saying what you did, you tell us why you did each one of those things. Then you're really telling us a lot about who you are. You're giving us real insight. And that becomes a very interesting story that all of us want to hear. So I think that a lot of you can really uh, benefit by watching that video, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. The second video 
a little bit more esoteric. It's for people who've had a very um, convoluted life. You've done a lot of things that you're not sure how they connect, but they all add up to who you are. Uh, the video is called How to Structure a Video Essay. It's by Tony Zo, and he basically looks at an Orson Welles documentary that has not one, not two, not three, but six different subjects that it balances between its entire length. It's a feature length film. And instead of telling six stories one in a row, it tells six stories all at a time. It tells them in parallel. It tells a little bit of each story and then jumps to the other, jumps to the other. And you don't really know the full extent of each story until you come all the way to the end. And that builds suspense. It creates uh, a rhythm. It, it creates uh, an interest and it's a different way to tell a story. And it only applies to you if you've got a lot of elements in your life that you possibly don't know why. Maybe you had a couple of different careers. Maybe you tried to do one thing and then decided it wasn't for you and you decided to do another. But everything that you did in your life informs who you are. It's a part of you know, telling us about yourself. So you don't leave those things out, you tell it all and maybe there's a way to tell those stories that's not necessarily chronological, but does make sense. So how to structure a video essay is how to tell a story with multiple elements in parallel. And the really interesting thing is that all of us are very familiar with this format, although we haven't really thought about it or realized it. And that this is, and that this is the very exact format that the TV show South Park uses for every one of its cartoon episodes. Every single episode of South Park is 22 minutes long. It has three different objects, subjects in it. They're all told in parallel and they all come together in the final scene. And every single uh, episode of South Park is told that way, uh, whether you realize it or not. And uh, that's part of the interesting thing that the, this video will tell us. So not something that everybody's gonna use, but something that if it works for you, it's uh, a great way to figure out how to get out of the, uh, the structural uh, question of how do you tell your story. Each of you are gonna tell your story. You're gonna have millions of t uh, options of ways to tell a story. And the big question for you is how to do it right now in the way that makes the most sense. Um, the last little bit of the reading that I wanna talk about uh, that you're gonna uh, indulge in this week has to do with how you, how you address yourself to an audience, how you match up against them. You know, we've, we, we've talked about getting to know your audience, you, re, you researching them, you choosing that audience. But now once you're going up against the audience, the audience has a chance to have a relationship with you that is of their choosing. And that's another different way of appealing to them. And this is something that people have been doing forever. The ancient Greeks used to do public speaking as a form of entertainment. And so uh, Aristotle wrote uh, a treatise 3000 years ago called the three pillars of uh, public speaking in which he uh, laid out that there are three different ways that you can appeal to an audience depending on your relationship to them. And this is still relevant to this day. So let's take a look at it. The first way that you can appeal to an audience, the first way you can ask the audience to listen to you and believe what you say is through ethos. It's the appeal to trust or credibility. It's that hail method. It's, hey, I'm speaking to you from my heart. I want you to believe me. I want you to trust what I have to say. Now, uh, some people just seem naturally trustworthy. You know, you're, you were born Tom Hanks and you can get away with it. Uh, some people have to work at it. Uh, sometimes people will trust you because of the references that you have. You're a doctor and you have, you know, big long spaghetti soup of, of, of initials behind your title. You're a PhD and a doctor of this and so on and so forth. So it could be your learned experience. But it doesn't have to be a huge resume that makes you trustworthy. It can be any simple lived experience. You could be a 10-year-old girl and stand up in front of people 
talk about cancer and you may not be a doctor or anything, but you can stand up and say, listen, uh, I lived with my mother for the last three years while I watched her die. And that lived experience makes me an expert on this topic. And those, and that very simple explanation can make, you know, people accept you as a trusted narrator. Now, whether or not they accept you, again, deals with how you speak to them, whether there's hail in your voice, whether they, you're using, uh, you're talking to them in a way that makes sense, whether the relationship is correct. But the appeal to trust is a major way that you can ask the audience to believe what you're saying. Now, sometimes you're, you don't have a lot of authority. Sometimes you're, you're not really an expert on the subject, but you wanna speak about it anyway. Well, you can use your enthusiasm. And in this case, you would use an appeal to uh, pathos, to emotion. You can let people know how excited you are about the subject and let people know how much you care about the subject. You're gonna appeal to their emotions. You're gonna uh, say, remember when you were young and didn't have you know, a, a lot of experience, uh, that's how enthusiastic I am. So the appeal to emotion is asking the audience to believe you, not for logical reasons or uh, you know, heartfelt reasons or um, you know, trust reasons, but for, for uh, emotional heartfelt reasons. And then finally, the third way that people can uh, believe you is the appeal to logic, logos. In this case, you're really dealing with lots of facts and figures and you really are expecting the audience to be skeptical. So everything you say, you're backing up. You're, when, you, when you give a figure, when you give a date, you're going to say where it came from. You're going to reference everything that you have to say so that people cannot just uh, poke holes in your story. You are mindful that they're looking to be skeptical and everything that you say is bolstered by facts and figures and statistics and charts and graphs and, and uh, uh, every fact builds upon another and you're, you're building a case of logic about why uh, what you say should be listened to. So each of these has some factors to go with it. In the appeal to ethos, the audience asks, does the audience respect you? Does the audience believe you're a good character? Does the audience believe that you're generally trustworthy? Does the audience believe that you're an authority on this topic? And again, the word authority does not necessarily mean, uh, you know, years in a college, you can become an authority through lived experience. You can become an authority because you were in the right place at the right time. So uh, um, the audience wants to hear what you say because you were there. You know, quite often in a news story, somebody who witnessed the building catching on fire, you know, they're just the passers-by, but they're the one that stood there while it burned and they're the authority on that topic because they were there at the right point in time. And so that forms a basis of, we want to hear your story. In pathos, uh, do your words evoke feelings of sympathy, fear? And the interesting thing about pathos, uh, you may be wanting people to like you, so you're gonna talk about happy emotions and show pictures of puppies. But pathos, the appeal to pathos can also go both ways. It can uh, get people into negative emotions as well. Your feelings, do your visuals evoke feelings of compassion, of envy? Does your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of hate or contempt? So we just passed through political season. And in political advertising, almost all of those advertisings are not um, pathos-based advertising of happy feelings, but of negative feelings. Pretty much all political advertising doesn't say, vote for me because I'm a great guy. It says, vote against the other guy because he's so terrible. It, it really involves putting down the competition. Now, you guys are not going to be involved in that at all in the presentation you're making because you have no competition. Uh, you have a magical three to four minute time to talk to your dream audience, and you do not have to invoke their fears or your negative thoughts at all. If you do, you're doing it to your own detriment. So I often hear in these presentations, students start off with, why should you hire me when there's so many other people? 
Well, that may be a true statement, but there's absolutely no reason for you to make it in your own presentation. This is a magical time in which you're controlling the point of view. So stating the negative point of view is bringing it in when you don't need to. Uh, so for, for this particular presentation, you guys need to know that only talk about yourself and don't worry about comparing yourself to the, to the competition because that's not what we asked you to do. You have a magical time where you can just talk about how great you are and leave it at that. You don't have, it's not your job to compare yourself to other people. So don't do it. it you can't do anything but hurt yourself that way. So in, uh, finally in Logos, uh, does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, and evidence? Will your call to action lead to the outcome that you promised? This is almost like the summation of a tr legal trial when a lawyer at the end stands up and summarizes all the evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard that so-and-so did such and such, and he, he told you this, and then we introduced this document that showed that this happened, and then we these fingerprints proved he was there. And uh, once you lay out all of that evidence, your call to action must inevitably lead to what you're asking people to do. Therefore, based on everything I said, you should convict this uh, um, person. You should hire me. You should buy this product. You should join this cause. You should uh, give money to this um, idea. So whatever it is you're trying to convince people of, you should lead inexorably towards the final call to action because that's exactly what you're trying to do with your logo based argument. So in any particular argument you make, you may lean towards one, but have overlap of another. You may basically be trying to give an ethos based argument, but you have a little bit of pathos in it or a pathos based argument with a little bit of empathy in it or a logos. It's very rare that you're going to have all three, but if you do, it's absolutely a winner. But these things are not necessarily 100% one thing or the other. They're percentages. And so you'll end up with uh, something in which you're, you're, you're trying to be credible, but you're also appealing to their emotions and so forth. But it's a great way to think about how to appeal to the audience and it helps you to build the performance or the presentation that you're gonna be working on this week. So uh, again, as you go through it, always a chance to, to make it better. So let's go back and take a look at how some of our uh, folks did, are doing with uh, visualizing ideas. Uh, you got Carlos with a, a, a very eager looking model that, that really says, uh, eager to me. Uh, and so we've got some people playing a board game. That's Dungeons and Dragons. Um, pretty dramatic. Uh, we have some adventurous people. Jasmine found some uh, white water rafters. Uh, and uh, I could well imagine that even though that photograph is exciting, if that were video, it would be even more exciting. So, uh, and there's no reason that you can't have video in your presentation as well as stills, uh, depending on what you want to use. Uh, and that brings us back to what are we going to put our presentations together with? We've talked about PowerPoint. We've all gotten free copies of PowerPoint. Uh, do we have to use PowerPoint? You can. If you feel good about PowerPoint, if you feel like you're in control of it, if you feel like that's the right tool for you, uh, and we just put the latest, greatest version of it in your hands, then please feel free to use PowerPoint. But know that there's some issues with PowerPoint. I'm going to have to talk about something in PowerPoint in just a minute because PowerPoint is so huge that they end up hiding some stuff from you, that there are things that you need to know about PowerPoint that aren't self-obvious. And people don't really ship you manuals with software anymore. So uh, sometimes there, there's ways of working in PowerPoint that you need to work that Microsoft doesn't tell you straight up. 
and they're kind of hidden. And uh, it's, they're not trying to be mean. It's just that there's software has gotten so big and powerful that it can't have all its options available at the, uh, uh, from the very outset. And software that's that complicated may not be software that you want to use in a hurry. So uh, it's up to you whether you want to use PowerPoint or not. You have your choice. We think it's great. We think it's powerful. If you feel comfortable with it, uh, familiar with it, please feel free to use it. If you feel like it's a little intimidating, then we're going to give you some options here. So uh, one of the links that I put in the discussion board here is an article with 40 different online alternatives. Now I can't t run through all 40 of these with you. Some of you uh, know some of these. Prezi, I don't think Prezi is a really good idea for this particular presentation, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, um, Emaze is another good one. A Haiku Deck is another good one. There are a lot of online tools. Google Slides is another good one. Uh, one of the problems with a lot of the online tools is they don't necessarily ha handle audio in the way we want. PowerPoint actually has its own recording tool, but that's why I also recommended Audacity. I mentioned Audacity earlier. Uh, Audacity is free open source software. It's available for Mac, Windows, or Linux. So you can't get it on your phone, but if you have a Mac or a PC, it's available to download for free. It's visual software and it works really well. It allows you to edit very easily and it converts to different file formats. So there's, there's really um, uh, a lot of pluses for Audacity and we highly recommend that you, you use Audacity to create your voiceover. And then once you create your voiceover on your own, you've got lots of options to go to for making um, the, uh, the presentation or, or putting the presentation together itself. Now our primary recommendation for making the presentation is Adobe Spark. Now, Adobe is the company that makes the creative suite with Photoshop and After Effects and Illustrator, all those really high-end programs that people learn if they're in the graphic arts community or the, or the film community. Uh, Adobe Spark is their free tool to make presentations with. And so uh, they're not the same thing, but we highly recommend Spark. It's free to use. You have to go to the Adobe Spark website and sign up. And you can just use your school credentials. But uh, the reason you need to sign up is that they're giving you free server space to store the files on their server. And so you need to uh, you know, become a member so that your private work stays private. But one of the great things that Adobe is doing that a lot of these other companies that are uh, providing online uh, presentation tools are not is they're giving you access to your materials. Um, there's a, a company that we used to recommend a lot called Powtoons. They offer really great animations that you can use to help tell your story. But Powtoons has lately begun uh, in engaging in this sort of um, uh, bait and switch operation where they make it really easy to join. But once you create something in Powtoons and you want to share it with other people, they make you pay. And we don't want you to do that. So avoid Powtoons. It's, it's, a, it's a trick. It's a trap. That's uh, that Fish General in, in uh, Star Wars says. Uh, but Adobe Spark is not a trap. You join them. You can create very easily. The uh, program itself is very simple. It's very powerful. It's very beautiful looking. And you can export an MPEG-4 video of the presentation. That's what we want you to do. We want you to create a video. Now, when you get started with Adobe Spark, note that there are three different types. Something called a social graphic. That's a static image. Something called a web page, which is, you know, multiple web pages on a short video. This is what you're using. This is what we're calling your presentation. Adobe, use Adobe Spark to make a short video. You can record your voice. You can have background music. You can have artwork. Uh, you have access to Adobe uh, art, uh, imagery, which is very powerful. Uh, it has access to Adobe video, which is very powerful. And you can add your own work. And it, it's very easy to put it together. It's very easy to export it. So um, 
if you're not uh, sold on any particular presentation tool and you want something that's simple to use but looks great and is powerful, then Adobe, Adobe Spark is what we are recommending. Coming back for some other options, if you have an Android phone that's a little bit older and therefore isn't learning on the latest uh, you know, uh, version of Android, uh, you may have trouble using a lot of these media tools. It may be that older, older Android phones just don't do a whole lot of multimedia work. Well, we found that VoiceThread is a software that works with a lot of the older Android phones. So if you're, if you're, you, if you're in that situation and you want to be playing in the ball game, try VoiceThread. We found that it works pretty well with older Android phones. Uh, but uh, Adobe Spark is our choice for a third-party software to create uh, on your own. And if you want to use PowerPoint, uh, you know, everybody's got PowerPoint, so it's available too. Uh, we also have some tips on here for using audio. We have an article about using audio Android apps. We have an article about using iOS voice memo uh, as your recording device. Uh, if you're going to use your phone and uh, you know, there's some interest in, there's a lot of good information about audacity. There's a lot of really good uh, quick tutorials on audacity audacity in uh, YouTube. So you can get started with that really quickly. Um, now the thing that I needed to mention about uh, PowerPoint, but before I get by going with PowerPoint, let me just take a pause and, allow questions. Anybody have any questions? If there was something in the chat here, I might have missed it because I, I, uh, uh, I wasn't looking, but does anybody have any questions for me right now before I talk about this? All right. So what I need to tell you about PowerPoint is that there is some hidden menus that you don't even have access to until you create certain media. So I am going to come in here very quickly and create some slides in PowerPoint. So I'm on my template creator. I'm selecting Atlas and uh, I come in and here I'm on my first title slide. So let me just uh, make that a title slide. I'm gonna call it my brand. And uh, I put my name on it. And uh, let me add a few more slides. So on slide two, I will uh, um, call that slide two. That's pretty pretty profound, isn't it? Uh, and on slide three, I'll call that slide three. So now I have a, a series of slides. How do I add audio to PowerPoint? Now, a lot of you have thought you could only add audio per slide. So you you have to, you know, add the audio to the slide as you're creating it. That is not what we want. We want you to have one single piece of audio that's three to four minutes long, runs continuously, and we want you to be able to, to move and, and, and change the slides amongst them. That's the way that this program is designed to be used. So the way that you do that is make sure that you're on slide one, start on slide one, and you're going to record your audio. PowerPoint records audio, so if you go to insert audio, record audio, you'll find that a little tool for recording audio pops up. Now, this isn't as visually sophisticated as the one from Audacity, but it works just fine. Uh, you can't edit anything with this tool. So if you get anything wrong with your voiceover recording, just stop it and record it again. And you can just record it as many times as it takes till you get it right. But I'm going to hit record right now, and I'm talking, and I'm recording my voiceover. So this is as if I'm going to make my three to four minute speech, and I'm going to keep going until I get it right. And when I get it right, I hit stop, and insert, and then an audio file falls onto my uh, um, slide one. Now, why is that important? Well, there are menus that are available 
until you actually have created some media. There is so much stuff in PowerPoint that Microsoft can't just make it all available immediately. So there are some hidden menus that until you actually create audio aren't available. And they're very important for creating the kinds of presentations that we want you to create. So once you've created a piece of audio, you'll notice that right now that there are eight menus up here at the top. Home, insert, draw, design, transition, animation, slideshow, review, view. When I select the audio file, once I have a piece of audio and I select it, there are two more menus that get added to the top. Audio format and playback. If I go to the playback menu, I have the choice to start that audio automatically or to click to make it begin. The default is to make it is that you have to click on it to start it. But I want you to play it automatically. We are creating a presentation that we want our audience to just sit back and watch the whole thing. We don't want them to have to click through this or, or do anything, do any work. So we want you to play the, the audio automatically. And very importantly, just below that, play across slides. So audio is locked per slide in PowerPoint until you tell it not to. And that's what we need you to do. We need you to click on this hidden menu of playback and hit play across slides. Now, once you've done that, you can come back to slide one and you can rehearse the run through and you can set the sync for when the slides change. How do you do that? Well, you go to the slideshow menu and you choose record slideshow. When I hit this button, the PowerPoint is going to go into playback mode and it's going to start playing the audio that it re I just recorded. And I can watch and listen. And when I hear in the soundtrack the point where I want to move from slide one to and two, I'm talking and I'm recording my voiceover. And so this, this is it. it. If I'm going to make it makes that transition for me. Speech and and I listen for the next transition. Right. And when I get it right, and this is it. And now it goes all the way through. Now you imagine I talked for three to four minutes and I got all 15 or 20 of my slides done. Uh, I come back. It asks me if I want to save these timings. I say yes. And I come back here and you can see what it's done. It's taking all those, all that single audio and spread it among different slides. It's put the first five seconds on the first slide the next six seconds on the second slide, the next 12 seconds on the third slide. And if I had more slides, it would have continued to go. Now, if my sync is incorrect, all I need to do is come back to record slideshow again, rerun the thing and change the sync. Uh, it's very simple, it's very powerful, but unless someone told you it was there, you would never know, you would never find it on your own. Believe me, we have lots of students who've torn out their hair because they weren't told the secret trick. And the other thing is, we want you to be able to add and delete slides at will. We want you to be able to use this uh, program uh, as it's meant to be run so that you can try out a lot of different ideas. You can try out a lot of different slides. You can change the order of the slides. Minutes you change any of these slides, if I change slide two to three, uh, now I have to come back and re-record this, but I can. It's very simple to do. So if you put all of your audio on slide one, then you have the ability to run that slideshow and change and sort those slides. And you can add slides very easily. You can take slides out very easily and so forth. So uh, you have a lot of power in PowerPoint if you uh, use it correctly. But you can only use it correctly if someone told you the secret. Now you know. So uh, pass it on. Uh, any more questions? Any questions? All right, well, I'm gonna let you guys go. There's really no reason to, to run long this week. Uh, you guys know what you need to do. You're spending the entire presentation, you're spending the entire month, week making a presentation. I wanna Hello. make a presentation. Hi. Have a question for me? Uh, my name is Javon. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Um, I saw you doing the presentations. It's very intriguing. Um, is it that it records my voice and spells out the words, or is it that I'm going to have to um, write it? Did you see how I recorded it in PowerPoint? Okay, so I could re I uh, there's an option for me to see everything that you have done. Yeah, this 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 is being recorded right now. So was, this is going to go up on the air in about an hour, so you can see. But essentially, uh, when I when I create a slide, if I'm on that slide, if I go to the insert audio record audio. Now, this is where I have to mention it really depends on what platform you're on because Mac and Windows have audio built into PowerPoint. But if you have Android or uh, iPhone versions of PowerPoint, those, uh, those phone versions of PowerPoint don't include audio. It's just- Okay, the, so yeah, I have an HP. So that should be good, right? An HP is a Windows machine. It should it should work fine. So you're going to find the audio here. Insert audio. Record audio. And you just get a little tiny guy like this, this window you see here. And when I hit the red button, it's recording. When I hit the black button, it stops. So it's very simple. And I can play it back. It's recording. When I hit, when I insert, hit insert, it goes on to my desktop. So that's how you make a file in PowerPoint. Now, also in PowerPoint, you can import external audio. So if I went to insert audio file, audio from file, if I created my audio in Audacity and just had an MPEG-3 file sitting on my desktop, I could select it right now. So you can import external audio into PowerPoint as well. But the, uh, the main thing about PowerPoint is that they want to be the soup to nuts tools for you. So they included the audio recorder as well. So it's, it's pretty much, uh, what is it called? Uh, integrity. Um, integrity. The Hale, using the Hale method. Um, honesty, yeah. authenticity. That's, that's, so yeah. they're just making sure they're looking for authentic, authenticity, right? Well, they're, they're just looking to make sure you, 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 you buy their product over anybody else's, but they're giving you a lot of features. Oh, okay. Understood. Understood. So um, the final presentation is, is, um, is what I'm going to use to present to my, the company that I'm trying to work for. Is that it? Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. So this is first draft. You're going to create an entire presentation. It doesn't mean rough draft, it means first draft. It means that you're gonna do the entire program. You're gonna do all the audio, you're gonna do all the slides, you're gonna have a complete presentation that's three to four minutes long. You're gonna turn it in Sunday night to me. And then I'm gonna give you feedback. And then Whoa. next week, you're gonna have a chance to make that same program a little bit better. You're not making a different program. You're just taking it and you're gonna tweak it and you're gonna add a little bit more. You're gonna fix some problems. Uh, you're just going to make it better in any way that, that you can think of. So next week is really not as much work as this week. This week, you're doing the entire presentation. Next week, you're improving it based on feedback. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm, okay, it's a draft. It's a rough draft of my presentation. Well, I don't like to say rough draft because sometimes people think that means missing something. It's a first draft. This is this is your this is your idea of what you want to do, and you're going to make it complete. But maybe there's some things that you can improve on it. Okay, understood. And uh, and it's due on Sunday. Value of feedback. Other people can see things that maybe you can't, and so if you get good feedback, that helps you make your program better. Okay. Okay. All right. Terrific. Any other questions? Uh, uh, our, no, that's it. Okay. Well, one other thing I'm going to mention is that um, this week's discussion board, I don't know, I, I hadn't mentioned it before, 
but it's actually set up to last through the rest of the month. It lasts through next week. So you're gonna okay. use this same discussion board next week. So while this week we're posting tips and tips for each other, you know, if somebody has a great experience with Audacity or somebody has a different audio editor that they wanna choose, you guys can write in and you can, you can uh, tell each other about it. If some of you wants to get feedback on your, your script before you, you read it and uh, record it, you can do those kinds of things. You're gonna get feedback from each other. But at the end of the week, when you turn in your finished program to me for a grade, I'm also encouraging you guys to post your finished program here for your fellow students. So in addition to getting feedback from me, your teacher, you have the opportunity to get feedback from your fellow classmates. Now this is completely voluntary. I can't force anybody to give you feedback. So it's a sort of uh, take a penny, leave a penny thing like at the, uh, uh, um, at the um, uh, 7-Eleven counter. If you help somebody else out, they'll help you out, maybe. But uh, we do want you, we encourage you to post your presentation here in the uh, 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 discussion board after you finished it and turned it in for a grade at the, uh, Sunday night. And Sunday night, I'm gonna do my best to turn those around and get you back feedback as fast as possible, Monday or Tuesday, you know, with, with everybody creating presentations. It's a long day for me to do an awful lot of feedback, but I really try very hard to get everybody uh, back at, uh, feedback as fast as I can uh, at, at the beginning of week four. And uh, that's what we're all about. So this week, go through the process, figure out your story, write it down, record it, rehearse it, get a good recording from the recording, figure out how you're going to do your slides. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that you can use to do it. If you're a video person, you can use video editing software. You don't have to use presentation software if you don't want to. Uh, you can use iMovie or Final Cut Pro or Premiere. Uh, but most part, I think that most of you are gonna find that Adobe Spark works really well. It's powerful, it looks good, and it gets out of your way. It just lets you work rather than being, have to figure out brand new software. So good luck, I'm gonna be around all week. I'm here to solve problems. So anybody who has an issue, uh, get a hold of me. And um, I'm rooting for you, I'm looking for great things this week. I want you guys to really be creative and you know, this is the moment you become full sailors. You're starting with a blank canvas. You're going to create some art. Let's do it. All right. All right. So that's that. That's that. <laughs>